questions. We have a great topic tonight on uh, data privacy. And before we get there, I just want to thank our 2011 uh, sponsors, Amazon, for helping make this program possible. Uh, next month, we are excited to bring uh, a group of commissioners from the State LGBTQ Commission, the Seattle LGBTQ Commission, and the Spokane Human Rights Commission to talk about, about the work that those in very important public boards do on behalf of our community. Uh, and again, the Civic Engagement Series meet at 5.30 on the third Monday of every month. So we hope we'll, you'll join us then as well. But now, in the meantime, it is my pleasure to introduce Eve Huang, a GSBA board member, the chair of GSBA's Membership Outreach and Engagement Committee, and a member of GSBA's Policy Council, who will be the facilitator for tonight's conversation. So thank you all, and welcome, Evie. Thank you so much, Matt. What a pleasure it is to be here on such an important and interesting topic. I'm delighted to be here with Co Congresswoman Susan Delbeni, who has represented Washington's first congressional district, which spans from Northeast King County to the Canadian border since 2012. She is currently the vice chair in the House Ways and Means Committee, a member of the Select Revenue Measures and Trade Subcommittees, and is also the chair of the New Democrat Coalition and co-chair of the Women's High Tech Caucus, Internet of Things Caucus, and the Dairy Caucus. She brings a unique voice to Congress with more than two decades of experience as a successful technology entrepreneur and business leader. Prior to her election to Congress, she served as director of the Washington State Department of Revenue, where she proposed reforms to cut red tape for small businesses and is also the sponsor of the Information Transparency and Personal Data Control Act, which is the subject of our conversation this evening. Congresswoman, welcome. Thank you so much. Great to be here. Thank you for being here. As we approach this conversation, um, perhaps we can just jump right in and give you some, an opportunity to talk about the bill and why you think it's necessary and what you think it will change. Well, um, right now we have technology and innovation that have really changed everything in our lives, the way we work, the way we live, but policy hasn't kept up. And so we now see issues where people's personal information is used in ways they never expected. Um, and this is really a civil rights issue, a civil liberties issue, a human rights issue. And we need to catch up and make sure that we have policies in place that protect people's most sensitive personal information. Right now, there's not a law, a consistent law um, across the United States. There are, there's a law in California that the state passed and there's a law that Virginia recently passed um, just this year. But, uh, but we don't have a consistent policy to protect people's personal information. And so as a result, we don't have those protections, protections that I think most people expect. And I think everyone has seen, uh, has seen a, a situation where their personal information has been used in ways they didn't expect, or it, there's been a breach and their um, data has been obtained by others. So Congress needs to act. And that's why I introduced my legislation, the Information Transparency and Personal Data Control Act. And what it would do is it would require companies to write their privacy policies in clear, plain language. You've all seen a pol privacy policy that's 20 pages long of legalese and people click accept and aren't sure what they're accepting. Um, we want to make this opt-in, which means that if a company is going to use sensitive personal information, they have to ask for your consent before they can do that. And, um, and they have to tell you what they're gonna do with that data if they collect it. Um, would it be given to others? What data are they collecting? So that you have complete information. The other thing we're missing in the country is enforcement. We don't have an enforcement body that really polices the legislation because one, we don't have the, the protections in place, but two, we need someone to make sure that people are following that. My le legislation would make the Federal Trade Commission the enforcement body so the, and also have a role for state attorneys general to play so that people are following the rules. Um, we also put in something called audit, um, uh, something about audit, because just like um, folks do in the financial world, we think that there should be audit uh, to make sure that people are practicing good data hygiene, protecting people, people's information, um, and following the rules again. Uh, and so audit is an important component. Um, and my bill would be a federal law, because I think we need uh, one to have a strong law that makes sure everyone knows what their rights are across the country. So 
for all of those reasons, um, to protect consumer rights, to make sure there's clear enforcement, to make sure that people know what their rights are and their data is protected, Congress needs to act. Thank you so much. I, I read the bill. It's it's very interesting. I, I really enjoyed how it seems to so work so well with itself. There's these intersecting components that that are complementary, and they solve so many problems that the industry is facing. Um, I wonder if, if maybe we can lean in a little bit to to really the the problem that we're trying to solve here. Um, identity has shifted online. Many of us have our offline identities, and they're merging with our online identities. I, I recently changed jobs and. Um, my LinkedIn profile was my resume, and that's how people came to know me, and they know everything about me, including my participation in an LGBTQ organization. Um, I want to really sort of try to dive into like what, what what's at risk here and what might be scary for people. Does this really help people understand, you know, how they present their identity online? Are we thinking about identity theft or other data breaches or the misuses of data? Like, what kinds of problems do you do you think that we're we're really addressing here? For so. For example, if you're using an app and it might be tracking location information that you don't know, maybe, uh, and using that in some way, maybe you want to be able to find something that's near to you, but you don't know that someone's actually taking that information and then using it in ways that you don't expect that don't have to do with the service to maybe help support advertising or maybe sell to others um, that will use it in a way that you don't expect. Um, you have sensitive information, healthcare information. Some of that information is protected under HIPAA, the current laws. Some isn't. So the fact that you may be part of a, a group on social media, um, that may be something that is uh, is that that information may be available more publicly than you realize because you haven't had consent. Um, you know, we worked with the human rights campaign on the language to make sure when we were talking about sensitive personal information, we made sure that things were that were protected were things like sexual orientation, gender identity, intersex status. Um, so if someone wants to share that information, that's fine, then they should know that they are sharing it versus someone using that information or collecting it in a way they don't expect and sharing it. Uh, so this is really fundamentally about pe putting people in control of their data. Um, and there's so many issues with technology that we could, we could talk about, but in the absence of even having fundamental privacy protections, um, what does it mean when we talk about issues of artificial intelligence and facial recognition, all these other things that build the top of it. If we don't have fundamental policy that talks about really what your rights are as a consumer and what your rights are with respect to something that's yours, your your personal sensitive information. Got it, thank you. That's really helpful. Um, I, I noticed that in, in the legislation too, that, um, that the idea of writing it in plain English helps. It's, instead of me having to read 30 pages of, of tr trying to understand what they're going to do with my data, you're gonna have folks explain it clearly. Is that, that's right. Yeah. Yes, and that's a role the FTC would play then is to make sure people are doing that. Um, again, one thing to write the legislation, another thing to make sure that people are really following those rules. And we don't have an enforcement body that really has, it feels like they have direct control over this issue. One, because we don't have the policy, the regulation in place. And two, we haven't clarified or given resources. My bill gives resources to the FCC so they can actually do that work. Um, that's part of what I think really makes a difference for consumers. Absolutely. Thank you. I also enjoy that it, it sort of gives companies a reason to think about what they're writing and, and maybe think about ways of making it a little bit more legible instead of just letting the lawyers write it and have it be very long. Um, there's a couple of groups that I think the GSBA is really focused on. I mean, we are an LGBTQ Chamber of Commerce, which is an interesting blend. We have a very strong business perspective, but also a very strong so social justice lens. And I think it gives us a wonderful perspective on the world to try to marry those two spaces. And there's a couple of communities that I want to ask about, and just to think about how they might interact with online privacy and particularly with this bill. And the first group would be small businesses. And in this case, small business might mean um, very small businesses of, of fewer than 10 people, but it could mean you know, mid-sized businesses that are maybe owned by LGBTQ employees. What does this mean for them? What's gonna change in their world as, they, uh, as this bill becomes law and um, they have to start interacting with it? So um, first of all, I think, we should highlight that fundamentally privacy legislation, we talk about it with respect to tech, the changes we've seen from technology, but 
every type of industry, every type of organization um, is very likely going online, interacting with their customers. So when we talk about the impact of legislation like this, it doesn't just impact technology companies, it impacts all companies, a retailer who might be collecting information because you're buying something from them. I highlight that because all so many small businesses are impacted beyond what people think of. Sometimes they just think it would be specific to tech organizations and that is not true. Second, in the absence of, of a consistent federal law, we could end up with a patchwork of different state laws. I said earlier, there's a state law in California. There's another state law now that's passed in Virginia. They're not the same. So if you're a small business, imagine having to navigate up to 50 different state laws and know that when someone has driven across the border from one state to another, that all of the sudden the rights change, maybe the way you interact with them changes, you have to put a dialogue box up to change something. You can, you can imagine how hard that would be, even for a big business, but for a small business, that almost prevents them from being able to do business in so many areas to keep up with that. Um, so the complexity would be very, very hard for small businesses and a national standard makes a huge difference because a national standard means that you know what the law is, you know what you need to do to comply and, um, and how it's gonna be enforced. And that's consistent across the country for all your customers. I might also add that if we're gonna have a seat at the international table um, and the US is gonna help drive policy, if we don't have a domestic policy, it's really hard to say how we address things at an international level. And Europe has a policy and that's already impacted even small businesses here in the US. So in the absence of us having a policy, we're kind of letting others drive those standards. It's even impacted small businesses right here. Yeah, that is that is really interesting um, because it is a systemic issue. The, the, you can't just sort of deal with it in one area. It really spans the whole the whole conversation of the way businesses operate. Um, a couple of pieces that I notice in, in the bill, and particularly the, the international, which I really am keen to ask you about, perhaps a little bit later, um, was the the, the idea of um, preempting state laws and actually saying we're we're just going to kind of cover the whole country with this, and that will simplify it for businesses. Another thing that I noticed in the in the bill was this idea that um, we're not necessarily providing people with a law that they can use in, as a basis for lawsuits. We're not, I think it's called private right of action. Um, and also another element that I, that I noticed in the bill was the role of state attorneys general in enforcement, because there's that, that idea that if the FTC doesn't choose to act, you can, um, without, within 60 days, that state attorneys general can, can get involved in that. This approach, like, can you talk a little bit more about why you settled in that approach to um, regulating this area and why that's the right fit for, for the country? Thanks, and I'm glad you, you've you like done a great job of reading everything, so I appreciate that. Um, the So preemption is important because, again, we don't want a patchwork. And if you have a patchwork of different laws, I think we should have one strong federal law. It's hard if one state has one and another doesn't, so then people's rights are only protected in certain places in the United States, and the complexity is hard. So that's why the bill is is uh, there is preemption in the bill because we should have one strong law as opposed to a patchwork. Um, the, the issue of kind of how is, does enforcement take place? Um, a key reason that we um, have the FTC do enforcement is because we need to know that there's someone focused and has the resources to focus on this. It's a hard thing to do. Um, but also we give the right to state attorneys general, as you said, to follow up if the FTC does not act um, so that they also have an enforcement power. The challenge, what we wanted to address, and, and that again for small businesses is not to be an environment where they are facing constant litigation um, from folks, but they understand the rules that they have to follow and that there's gonna be enforcement but um, private right of action can also mean just even the threat of constant lawsuits that make it really hard for small businesses, um, for small businesses to keep going. This has been an issue in other areas. And that's why I think it's important we look at small businesses and innovators that we keep that in mind, we put strong policy in place. So I think we can do both. I think we can have strong enforcement powers and make sure that people's rights are protected and make sure that small businesses and innovators 
are an environment where they can be successful. And that's what we're trying to do across all those areas in this legislation is try to protect folks in, in those ways, both consumers. And I say small businesses because larger organizations might have the resources to have more attorneys or other folks or, or just dollars to, um, to go to court. Um, and yet for a small business, especially if there are frivolous lawsuits, it's very hard for a small business to keep up. So I think yeah. we really have to have strong policy that keeps all of that in mind. And that's what we were looking at um, when we put together this legislation. I understand it was somewhat controversial. There's, I mean, there's obviously loads of people have different opinions about things and some will say it's too much and some will say it's too little. In that case, I'm, I'm curious about as we develop a, a society that is a, a global leader in technology and certainly the United States has always been a global leader in technology. Do, do you feel like this is something that we are having to sort of find the best case um, compromise for something that people will align with behind? Or do you really feel this, this represents like an ethic and an approach to regulation of of technology and information sharing um, well, that really can be a I basis do, to build on going forward. I do think it's foundational, just like you said, a basis going forward. Um, the if first of all, there's a my bill is fairly narrow in terms of looking specifically at consumer data privacy. Um, there are others that go into many other issues um, about uh, about into artificial intelligence. I said facial recognition start to go more broad. I felt like it was very important that we had something foundational in place to build off of because right now we really don't have anything. So it's not like we are operating from an environment where people have a lot of protections in place. Those protections aren't there. And, um, and we do have differing, we wanna make differing interests. We wanna make sure consumers' rights are protected. We wanna make sure that it works so that people can get the services and products that they want um, without an environment that's so hard that businesses can't use it and in particular small businesses. And so that's really, that the effort that we put together learning from what has happened in Europe um, and from the state laws that have been put in place uh, to make sure that we have a strong standard and it is something that we can build on in terms of expanding um, in so many other ways that technology touches our lives where we're behind from a policy standpoint. Yeah, I can get that. It, it is gonna have to start somewhere. And the United States is sort of known as a nation that isn't necessarily keen on regulation. It's not the most regulated nation in the world. And I say that coming as a European myself. Um, in my former role, I worked at a company that had European offices and was subjected to GDPR, which is the EU's um, privacy regulation, which is famously very strict and, and has heavy penalties for companies that don't comply to it. Um, and what we found as a business was that because we operated in that environment, we had to adopt those policies and practices within the United States as well. It didn't make sense to think that there could be two standards and we just sort of leveled up to GDPR. Um, how do you see the United States approach and um, way of, of, of addressing these privacy concerns um, stacking up against something like GDPR, which does have such a dominant presence in the, the privacy and information sharing space? So it's interesting that I just wanted to highlight when you said you just you decided, which many companies did to use GDPR as kind of a, a standard because two is going to be hard. Imagine 50. Um, yeah. And you kind of highlighted right there why differing state laws across the country would be so challenging. Um, in fact, someone from the EU um, had talked to me and said, you know, we it's not like we have everyone um, who who um, came, you know, was on the same page at the beginning, we had to work together to develop one standard too. And I think it's important for us to keep that in mind. But also keep in mind, we are generally the innovators. We are yeah. the folks who um, developed. And I think that as we look at setting standards and especially global standards, we wanna make sure that we support that innovation. And so that's definitely something that I've kept in mind as we um, put together this legislation is to make sure that we're not stifling innovation and there are places where GDPR makes it harder for a new business. Um, so we absolutely want to make sure that we have consumer protections, strong consumer protections, and as we said, make sure that those small businesses and innovators um, aren't saying, hey, we're not going to go forward because it would be too onerous for us to do so. 
And we don't have a seat at the international table, really, if we don't have a domestic policy. If we can't come up with one policy here, how do we go and work um, on a global basis? And again, to our earlier part, if it's foundational and we're building off of that, if we're gonna talk about so many other areas that we wanna work on and, and help be engaged and involved on global standards, we've got to get started because again, we don't have those protections in place right now. Yeah, it's really important. Um, global leadership and technology is something that we, we have to bring. And if we don't have the space for, for privacy law, then it, it definitely is a big missing for us. And, and I think it would be really helpful to have the US at the table with something like GDPR, which is pr pretty stringent and pretty difficult to, to comply with. I mean, it's a good law, but it's definitely an approach that's um, unfamiliar, I think, in our space. Um, do, do you see this as being part of an increased appetite in the US government for um, bolder global leadership and technology? Do you feel like we're, we're kind of picking up momentum in this area? Is this part of that? Well, I think there's more awareness. You know, when I first started working on these, I felt like I was kind of telling folks, hey, we got to catch up. We've got to work on this. Um, these are important issues. And um, now I think more people understand that. The challenge we have is they're complicated issues. A lot of legislators don't understand them well. They understand the idea of privacy, but what that means in terms of exactly how a privacy regime would take would work and what needs to be in a piece of legislation, that's a place where I think we spend a lot of time trying to educate other lawmakers. So they not only think about the concept of what they're trying to achieve, but what does it really mean in practice? What does it mean for your members who would have to actually um, follow a regulation like this and be able to um, follow that, do the right thing and still be successful in their business. That's harder. And so I think the challenge that we have is educating legislators at all levels of government, um, but also getting started instead of just kind of adding the rings on to the onion and thinking about all the things we need to do we got to start, get moving, understand, um, gather that feedback, set up the infrastructure for enforcement, et cetera, and build on that. And um, I think we're behind. And so I feel a great sense of urgency around this, but I think people now understand and have seen what's happened to their data. So there is much more awareness from legislators and individuals um, for progress. And, but the, the challenge is actually getting it done. Yeah. I love that you're the chair of the Internet of Things Caucus. That that sounds so so fun. I, I work in technology, and, and the idea of having a device around my house that can connect to the internet that I don't know if it's been updated is, and it's potentially a risk thing. It's obvious to me, but I realize for a lot of folks that doesn't stand out. Um, I love that. I think it's great. And there's privacy there too, because the Absolutely. number of devices that are out there that can collect data is much more than people think you know, of their tablet or their PC or their phone. And um, now it might be their car or their doorbell or you know their energy uh, energy um, system they have in their house. All of these things might have data, and I think it's really important that people know what data is being collected, what's not, and what their rights are. And that's really what this conversation is all about. You mentioned that it was a foundational approach, and I think that's really clear, and I love that. Um, where, where do you see this growing? Like, what do you think are the issues, the next sort of issues in line that we might want to tackle to, to really expand and build upon the foundation we're putting in place? Well, I think um, there's a lot more, there's a lot of issues around cybersecurity, making sure that businesses are doing everything possible to protect data. Um, and there are some, some um, there have been work there, but again, you want to make sure that not only are you using a product that you think is great and maybe you understand what's information is being collected, but how are they storing it? Um, are they doing the best job of making sure that data is protected and it's not vulnerable? There might be attacks even for folks who are doing all the right things, but at least you wanna make sure you're working um, with an organization that's doing the right things versus one that maybe is leaving the doors wide open. Uh, there are many issues um, with you know, facial recognition is probably a good example. Um, algorithms and algorithm bias, uh, all are areas that I think as you get beyond privacy are areas of technology that we've talked about um, um, kind of generally, but we haven't really put in place a clear framework for how things will work. And again, if you think about civil rights, human rights, um, civil liberties in a digital world, 
how do we make sure that we're keeping up that the same things you would expect in another in a non digital scenario are true in a digital scenario and i'll give you one one quick example um, there's a there's right now if you have an email that is in the cloud that's stored on a server most likely in the cloud today that if it's over 180 days old it's considered abandoned because um, a law was written in 1986 that says that if you didn't download that mail from a server onto your machine, that it was abandoned. And abandoned means that it's no longer subject to a warrant. So law enforcement can access it without getting a warrant. Well, I think everybody here assumes that your email is protected and just like a sheet of paper in your file drawer, if law enforcement wanted access to that, they would need a warrant. That's your constitutional right. It is not true in a digital world though. And it's not because people intended to do something different. Back then in 1986, you really did kind of download something or, or it was abandoned, but the, the law didn't change, but our world did. I think probably everyone here listening probably has an email sitting on a server in the cloud that is over 180 days old. And that's a constitutional right that is not the same in the physical world as it is in the digital world. These are the things that we need to address to change so that people's rights are protected based on the way that we live and work um, today, which, and technology has changed that. That's great, thank you. So I think I have emails over 180 days in my inbox still, which is even more of a problem. And your inbox is, is <laughs> probably in the cloud, right? It's probably- Absolutely. Right, and so, um, but no one knows that because why? how would you know that? Um, and we have a bill called the Email Privacy Act just to try to fix that one thing. Well, thank you so much. It's been so fun to talk to you. I, I really appreciate this talk. I really appreciate your leadership on, on moving this all forward. Unfortunately, we're out of time and um, I'd like to let you go, but thank you so much for being here and talking to us about thank this Thank you. This is great. It. I really appreciate the time and all of your research into the legislation too. Thank you. Thank you. Take See you care. soon. Bye. So thank you, Congresswoman. Um, Matt, I believe we're going to invite another guest to join us for the remainder of the, the session. Is that right? Kelsey, hi. Hello, there we go. There we are. Unmuted and un, uh, turned off my video in the interest of privacy. <laughs> thank you and welcome. Welcome to Kelsey Finch. And just by way of introduction, Kelsey is the senior counsel for the the Future of Privacy Forum. She leads projects in smart cities and communities, data de-identification, and ethical data sharing and research. Her work has been published in the Cambridge Handbook of Consumer Privacy, the Fordham Urban Law Journal, and the Santa Clara Law Review. Before working at the Foundation Future of Privacy Forum, Kelly was an inaugural Weston Fellow at the International Association of Privacy Professionals. As an expert on this very topic, thank you so much for being here. Thanks so much for having me. It's great to continue the conversation. Um, I really appreciated learning about the, the legislation. Um, this um, legislation, you know, the people have opinions about it. And there's like with any piece of legislation, there's always a range of thought around it. But from the perspective of someone who's studied privacy and, and really is grounded in this work, how does this bill arrive in the community of people who, who care about this topic? Yeah, absolutely. So a, a great question. And I think this is a really remarkable time uh, just to give folks some framing. If you'd asked folks in the privacy community, five, 10 years ago, if we were likely to see a federal privacy law within this time frame, you would have been laughed out of the room. Um, things have really changed in the last two or three years. And it's uh, you know incredible actually to be able to have a conversation and to have multiple bills out there at a federal level, to have multiple states passing this legislation. Um, and so when we look at uh, Congresswoman Delvani's bill, I think we look at it and we see it's a remarkable bill for the business community to be rallying behind. Um, and it contains a lot of elements that we like to see in federal bills. Um, so heightened protections for sensitive data are really important. Um, the sort of regular use of privacy audits or risk assessments that might be available to an agency like the Federal Trade Commission, I think is really important and impressive. Um, and then clear distinctions in the roles and responsibilities for companies and their service providers is also really helpful, I think. Interoperability, uh, that sort of tends towards interoperability with frameworks like the GDPR and, and others. And so uh, definitely a, a starting point for these conversations federally. Wonderful, thank you. I, I'm especially interested in the, um, the, 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 the power behind the bill, like the ability to enforce it. Like as I mentioned during the, the previous session, um, 
have worked at a company that, that encountered GDPR. And we were very concerned about the enforcement measures and claims handling GDPR. Um, the way that this bill is, is structured um, empowers the FTC to not only enforce the, the bill as it's written, but also to impose or, or enact future um, regulations. Um, what do you see them doing with that? Like what, what regulations do you think the FTC are gonna add and, and how's that enforcement gonna go? Well, it's a really good question. Uh, you know, enforcement really is this key issue that we've seen so many proposals hung up on. The current Washington Privacy Act three years in a row has failed to cross sort of this hurdle of how do you enforce privacy rights? You know, and I think as the Congresswoman was saying, there's hopefully a, an approach to navigate that's the path forward um, where we can both respect privacy and enable, um, you know, services and innovation. Um, and so, you know, I, I think that the Federal Trade Commission does a really fantastic job as a um, dedicated privacy regulator. They've got a wealth of experience and expertise um, that is unique in the United States and that I think is um, especially important as we see technologies continue to evolve pretty rapidly and new business models and new ways to use personal information um, hit the market. Um, you know, privacy advocates tend to, uh, you know, hold a position and tend to believe that private rights of action are essential to give people redress when their privacy is violated, right? That you need to shift corporate practices by hitting companies in their pocketbooks. Um, you know, industry folks on the other side, um, you know, will tell you that private rights of actions are probably tending to enrich plaintiff's attorneys and might subject companies to frivolous lawsuits. Whereas a dedicated enforcement agency could act more strategically, provide more guidance um, across industries. So, you know, I think this is just that there's probably um, a way to navigate, to think through what are the approaches that really work for fundamental civil rights protections? And those might be different than um, enforcement for more procedural um, concerns, right? If your privacy policy needs to be updated, that seems like a different kind of privacy violation than if you are um, you know, using information in really inappropriate ways and ways that are deceptive or unfair to individuals. So I think there's a lot of work to be done um, you know, as a country on this question, uh, but this is a great you know, place to have the conversation. And I think definitely important for us to think about what will shift practices, right? I think one of the things that we're seeing in these conversations is a shift away, right? Eva, as you were saying, sort of that needs to read a million pages of privacy um, terms of service and little pre-checked buttons and hidden X's that you can't ever find. Um, so shift, that, that's sort of what we've traditionally called the notice and comment or notice and consent um, framework where it really puts a burden on individual people to understand what's in the legalese and then to decide if they want to use a service or not. And that's not super, that's not realistic. We, none of us ever do that. I don't read the privacy policies and you know, I'm a privacy professional. Um, but what we're seeing is a shift towards more substantive proposals and more protection for um, you know, civil liberties and anti-discrimination provisions and laws. And I think that's an interesting trend for us to continue to see. So right, a lot of power in financial penalties, that 4% of global turnover or up to 20 million euros penalty really shifted behavior, um, I think at the executive level, you, you saw that first. Yeah. <laughs> um, but there are other ways to do enforcement too. And so thinking through what are the other kinds of substantive obligations we can bake into the laws? Can we make companies do things like risk assessments that actually might improve their policies and their practices at a really tangible way that just having a big fine might not do. Um, and so thinking through what are some of the creative ways that we can find to bridge this gap that has unfortunately sunk um, otherwise promising legislation in other spaces. So a lot of thoughts on enforcement, but yeah. I think really thorny nut, and, but a really important one for us to, to crack. And I think it's particularly important to note that that this bill is really foundational. So we're, we're starting with something and there's always the opportunity to grow and evolve from there, which is I think very wise in the technology space, given how Absolutely. many things have been tried that haven't worked that we've had to come back and revisit. So let's just build that kind of learning behavior into the process and then hopefully we can have it work. Yeah, absolutely. Sort of unintended consequences of well-intentioned legislation is something that we spend a lot of time trying to um, think, th right, thinking through all of the contingencies. I think we had some student privacy um, bills passed a couple of years ago that were trying to prohibit the use of student biometrics, so creepy facial recognition things in schools, but they wrote the bill so broadly that um, uh, actually a yearbook photo qualifies as a face print or as a biometric, and so for a while there were criminal penalties associated with publishing a yearbook uh, in a couple in a particular state or 
And that's exactly the kind of thing that nobody intended, right? So you needed to be really thoughtful about the ways this will impact a variety of industries for these comprehensive bills, because we're not one size fits all, but data is everywhere, um, I think is really important and, and definitely worth the time to get it right and to start foundational and build from there. Yeah, thank you. Um, I, I noticed a, a core um, objective of the bill is to give people control over the choices that they're making, to make sure they actually can understand it and they can understand it easily and that they can say yes and they can say no. Um, is that enough? I mean, wh where do we grow from just simple consent? I mean, consent is just the starting point. I, if I find myself on a new app and there's a privacy policy and I read it and it's like, well, I don't really know how I feel about it, but I really want to use this app. Where, where do we grow from there? Like, how do we sort of strengthen people's control and, and ability to interact with this? Yeah, so I think there's a couple of things that we can do. One we're starting to see already, and in, like most of most or many of these bills at least are starting to um, push more on individual rights. So giving people more than just the ability to say yes, no, um, and that's it, but to say you might have a right to access your information, to correct it, to delete it if it's no longer relevant or accurate about yourself. In some places, you might have a right to take the information with you from one company to another. So if I shift from Pandora to Spotify and I want to exercise my right of portability in Europe, um, that's something that we're starting to see um, be considered here in the US. Um, we're starting to see things around opt-outs of sale and sharing of information for particular uses, usually around targeted advertising. Um, and I think interesting footnote there is that those aren't just happening, uh, particularly those uh, changing um, landscape around advertising technologies and sell, sell, sales of data isn't just happening in the law, it's also happening through platforms, right? So we've seen Apple um, recently, uh, you know, add new settings around restricting um, ad tracking and doing enforcement through its app stores. And so good for companies to be paying attention to the fact that you, it might not be legislation that actually makes this the default in the country. It might be one of these big tech platforms um, that folks are accessing their services through. And that can be just as powerful. Um, so we're starting to see these new rights, uh, individual rights. And those are important, but probably not going to get us all the way there because this is still putting a lot of pressure on individuals to manage the data out there about them. And they might not even know how many companies have their data or what they're using it for. And so those asymmetries can be um, you know, hard to really resolve the issue. Um, but what we are seeing is some of these more substantive proposals saying things like data minimization um, and having more limited purposes and sharing. So reasons that companies will have information and then restrictions on doing you know, anything they want with it downstream. Um, and these provisions hope uh, to stop the kind of practices that mean, um, one of the common examples we use here is that, you know, if you download a free flashlight app um, that you downloaded because the power went out and you needed to like find your stuff, that flashlight app might have asked for access to all of your contacts and all of your location history. And that seems very disproportionate. And so thinking yeah. through the substantive business practices that can address those kinds of mismatches and help consumers um, have a little bit more trust in what their information is being used for and in the organizations that they're giving it to. Um, you know, I think we're also starting to see a shift towards, um, right, like as the Congresswoman was saying, towards thinking about anti-discrimination and algorithmic profiling uh, and systems that have that kind of, um, you know, widespread impact on individuals and communities. And I think that's a really important direction for us to be going as well. And all of those are shifting some of the, you know, some of the work onto the shoulders of the companies who have the data, who understand um, what it can be used for and what it will be used for, and then taking um, a little bit more off the shoulders of individuals. Yeah, it, it is it is troubling to know that there's no regulation out there and that companies can do things that perhaps serve their best interests, but but when you actually look at it externally, you think this can't be right. You, this can't be legal. You can't be allowing people to do this. Um, one of the the areas that I know the GSBA is very focused in, and I am personally too, is seeing how um, the way racism plays out in the United States over the past couple of years in particular has really drawn this conversation to the forefront and organizations are reassessing their contribution to racism in our society and, and really seeking to eliminate ways that they might be unconsciously um, participating in, in promoting and encouraging it. it. Can you maybe speak to maybe just generally speaking about um, digital privacy and how it shows up in places like racism or even just gender bias and homophobia and transphobia and that kind of thing? Yeah, absolutely. Right. It, it is um, one of these critical moments that um, and, and 
just to put more context in it, privacy used to be in the US a lot more about data protection, right? So safeguarding the information that organizations were holding. And as we shift more, the conversation is more about power and trust um, and who has control and who gets to um, define who you are in the world. And I think that's a really important, powerful shift for us to be thinking about privacy as more than just safeguarding the data that we hold, but be thinking really about what it means for individuals and communities um, to be able to define themselves and to be able to um, you know, control who, who puts labels on them, I think is really um, something important. Um, it's also important for us to pay attention to the ways that um, biased data can influence the opportunities that are presented to us um, or not, often in ways um, that we can't see happening. So this is where a lot of the increased focus on um, civil rights and uh, anti-discrimination and algorithmic automated decision systems particularly is landing. Um, you know, it, these sorts of systems determine who gets recruited and hired for jobs, what we pay for products and services, whether we're sent on um, bad dates or not. There's all sorts of ways that this information gets used. Um, right, so one of the ones that um, we found particularly striking is that um, Harvard Business Review did a study a couple of years ago. Um, they found that most, most hiring algorithms drift towards bias by default. Um, so that means that if you post a, a broadly targeted ad on Facebook um, for a supermarket cashier position, um, that's mostly going to be shown to, a, to an audience of about 85% women. Um, if you post a job for a taxi company, that's going to go to an audience that's about 75% Black. So that is just, a, you know, taking existing biases and reinforcing them in somewhat invisible ways. And so it's really important for companies uh, and regulators to be thoughtful about how do we target that kind of um, you know, unintentional impact? And how do we be really smart about putting transparency and accountability in place around these systems? Um, and it's not always, it's not the case that all discrimination is bad. These are also used to target proactively to certain groups. Uh, this is like, if you want to reach folks who are LGBT, like you want to get folks watching this kind of programming, you need to be able to, to identify them and reach out to them and find your affinity groups. Um, but it's being really thoughtful then about what we use the information for and being careful about the times that we are um, reinforcing bias or using it in ways that might be um, sort of against individuals' interests. Um, you know, this is, the, and as I was saying, it sort of runs the gamut from really serious um, you know, hurdles to people getting employment and insurance and credit and housing and education. Um, but there are like lots of, as we move our world online, we do schooling and socializing. For everybody who's you know, dating online in the pandemic, you should know that companies like OkCupid have done A-B testing a lot, where to test whether their algorithm is actually doing compatibility correctly, they'll send you on an intentionally incompatible date to see how it works out. So being really thoughtful about what the other things happening in your digital interactions are, I think is really useful, right? Like that's, it's, it's crazy to think about. Yeah. Um, you know, I totally understand the perspective of they need to know if the algorithm's right or not. Um, but as a user, it feels slightly different to learn that, um, you know, in the terms of service or in a, you know, an academic article or through a news headline than if you had a conversation with the company and it was made a little bit more clear, perhaps. Um, and that that's maybe the cost of doing business with this particular service or that that's how they're targeting or how they're improving their algorithm like that make make you happier with the trade off. Um, but so just to say right that I think as we go through these conversations it's good for companies and it's good for um, legislators and lawmakers to know that. Um, you know, doing this piece on privacy, doing this piece on civil liberties is table stakes these days right it's we, we've moved beyond the days when simple. Um, you know, securing the data was enough. Now it really does need to be about how do we protect people uh, and their interests in a variety of spaces. Yeah, that's really striking how insidious that might be, that I wouldn't even know that I would be given opportunities and invited to things and sort of invited to apply for jobs or invited to go on dates or even, even casual things that I would think everyone was getting to see because how would I know any different? My experience of the social media platform say is is that's I think that's what everyone else sees, but that might not be true at all. We could be effectively creating a, a very um, sophisticated way of segmenting people into um, social groups that they wouldn't have any mobility from, and it wouldn't necessarily be the groups they would choose to belong to. Um, it's really striking because you'd never see it. It would just it would just disappear from view. I remember I was complaining to a friend about the um, being advertised these sort of flat water bottles 
it was all my, my feed was like, they really, I clearly believe that I really want a flat water bottle, but my friend hadn't seen them because they presumably weren't in the demographic of people who get promoted to those. It didn't never really occurred to me that that would actually be the case. I thought everyone was seeing these things at the same time. Yeah, we've seen a couple of funny, funny because they're sort of benign anecdotes, but folks who will be searching for, um, you know, diamond rings, searching for an engagement, and they'll pop up and they'll follow, they'll pop up on a shared machine and suddenly, um, you know, your significant other is like, hey, what's up? I think this, the surprise has been ruined. Uh -huh. um, but yeah, it is really interesting the way, and I think, you know, to, to really, to go from fairly, uh, you know, humorous all the way up to I think the most striking, um, you know, example of this we have at scale is the Cambridge Analytica situation, where we really saw the power of that ability to, um, you know, politically micro-target and to have access to this vast array of, um, you know, data collection and targeting that folks might not otherwise say, and then use that to shape the media that they're consuming and the filter bubbles that they live in, and that this is a real challenge um, that extends beyond just the privacy space, but to our whole digital lives. Yeah, as we to become digital people and really evolve into a digital society, this is something we can't we can't see our um, electoral system be become people losing faith in it because the data is so well segmented that perhaps you have a totally different perspective than someone else who's voting in the same election as you are. Great, but I think it's great to make these um, use these examples to help it illustrate for people because it can be really abstract. Um, but whenever you can actually imagine it applying to you, it makes it a little bit more easier to to engage in. Um, I did want to ask you, though, about something that's just personally very interesting to me. Um, obviously, the EU is this very strong space that has GDPR and a real interest in technology. Another nation that I'm very interested in is China, where they have a very well-regulated internet system. It's, it's heavily regulated. <laughs> they will choose which sites you can and can't see. And China is a growing power. I mean, they have um, you know, really fast uh, cellular networks. They have extraordinarily successful shopping platforms and money transfer platforms and social media. Um, as the US sort of engages in this global conversation. Uh, how does this evolve? Like, how do you see this growing globally as a sort of global understanding of data privacy and not just a national one? Can you yeah, speak a little bit about that? Oh, no, I was saying it's a great question. I will I will flag, I am not an expert on the um, current state of Chinese data protection, but I have a colleague who is. Um, so wow. uh, if you want to learn more, happy to send you a blog post um, from uh, sort of overviewing what's going on in that space now. Um, so the good news is actually, uh, well, so the good news, bad news. The bad news is that in many ways, the United States is getting outpaced on data protection. I think Congressman Delvane had that exactly right. We It's hard for us to have a seat at the table these days without a more comprehensive uh, approach to, data, to privacy and data protection. Um, on the other hand, it is rapidly spreading uh, around the globe. I think um, Gartner has a report that suggests that within the next couple of years, 65% of the world's population will be governed by a modern privacy regulation, um, which is, uh, I think, an incredible uh, percentage. And so we look at it and we see the GDPR, this European um, framework is really the gold standard that um, is serving as a model and an inspiration um, for a slate of new laws around the world. Um, and we do see, you know, over the last year or so, we've seen serious new legislation proposed and sometimes passed in really major markets, as you were saying, places like China, places like India, places like Brazil. Um, and, and I think those are all really important forward movements. Um, but we're also seeing places that had, um, you know, existing laws do an update and, and make them sort of help do that modernization, um, making sure that things like that um, ECPA 180 day email, um, you know, remnants um, can get addressed and that they folks are rising to the level of GDPR and, and others. Um, we're seeing that in places like Canada um, is actively going through that process right now, Japan, South Korea, Singapore, Russia, New Zealand, there's um, an incredible number of nations that are taking this moment to reassess what their frameworks are and to be innovative with them, to think through, right, you know, one of the important and I think um, exciting things about privacy is that it is culturally inflected. It, you know, what it, what's yeah. important and what your, your sort of preferences and priorities are really depend on who you are and the society you're part of and the community you're part of. And so we're going to see some variation um, around the world. I think that's great. I think that's being able to reflect those values is an important part of that. Um, and in the US, we have a very rich history, actually, of privacy law reaching back to the 1960s and 70s that I often don't think we get enough credit for. Um, actually, the sort of, you know, the Fair Credit Reporting Act in the 1970s actually gave us all of these, like the rights that I was talking about earlier, access and correction and deletion. Um, those started in the US. That, that was a unique thing for oh, us for a long time. Right. So we got to hold our heads up high on a couple of these things. Um, <laughs> 
But you know, as the it has been a largely patchwork um, system. So as the largest markets in the world move towards more comprehensive uh, privacy and protection laws, I, I think it's not a surprise that our lawmakers are feeling pressure to step up. Um, and so I think you know th there is this great tradition that we should be calling upon, right? The um, yeah. The fair information practice principles uh, in large part came out of work done in the 1960s and 70s in the US. Um, but we need to, you know, think through what our next steps will be and become a leader in the space by thinking more holistically uh, about the ways that we collect and use and protect information rather than continuing down this path of having uh, a patchwork um, that is increasingly difficult for individuals and companies and uh, regulators to navigate. Thank you so much. That's a great call out. I, I really just got that as you said that. Like, yes, yeah, absolutely. And it's, it's such a long history of engagement in these conversations. I mean, freedom of speech is this core American value that we always cling to. We've definitely incorporated this kind of understanding in our in our national consciousness. And you're absolutely right. Well, thank you for pointing that out. Um, you know, as we approach the end of, of, of the questions for this evening, I just wanted to, to take a moment to ask, was there anything that, that sort of came up over the course of the evening that we didn't d delve into that we really ought to have have thought about more. Like, what are we, what are we not seeing here that you would want to add to the conversation? Yeah, you know, I think the the sort of the two key points for me are for folks to pay attention to those things that aren't legislatively driven. Pay attention to the movement on the platforms and the technology systems and to like folks are probably familiar with the you know the phrase that code is law, but it is true and code can move a lot faster than law. So it might be that the platform set the you know set the requirements. And we saw this in California before. California had passed a law that required privacy policies, just saying what you do um, for the first time, but it didn't really have much force until Apple started requiring them in the app store. And then we started to see them really um, percolate through the system. Um, we also see, you know, consumers and individuals engage in self-help through technology. We saw a spike in the use of virtual private networks and folks doing ad blockers mm. and thinking through technological yeah. tools to, you know, take more control over their lives. And that's not necessarily an arms race that you want to be in with your customers. You want them to trust you, but that's, uh, those are options that are out there. And so good to be paying attention to both the technology side and the legal side and the evolution of social norms. I think an important part that folks don't mm. um, often pay attention to is that these things change really fast. And a lot of privacy is about um, having control, right? Feeling like you have some ability to exert power over what's happening to your own information. So one of the things they like to think about is the people's reactions to like Google Glasses. Um, so when they first, Glass, yes. right? Like when they first came <laughs> out, people were freaked out people like if you Absolutely. wore them in a public space you were surveilling them you were doing who knew what people would punch you they'd call you a glass hole they'd kick you out of uh, you know bars and other establishments it was this really visceral reaction um and if you you know move the dial forward a couple of years later snapchat released its spectacles that were super cool and hip and everybody was flocking to the vending machines in san francisco and new york to get them and they had a cool little privacy by design feature which is that you could see a little wheel that would go it would shine a light when that was recording so other people could know when they were on camera that was a helpful feature and then you know shift the dial a couple of years later you can go to any kind of you know massive you can go into any store you can find smart glasses at, you know at any number of companies and people just kind of shrug and they go like eh, like they're pretty like we went from really creepy to really cool to really commonplace in the course of about six years it's not a very long time so you know, as new technology enters, as new business practices enter, people need time to get used to them, but people will adapt. Uh, and so, you know, being thoughtful about the ways that the sort of the technology is changing, the laws are changing, the norms are changing, I think really sets folks up for um, a more nuanced appreciation of these issues and how to really help um, rebuild trust and, and, you know, ensure that you are protecting privacy in a way that matters to people. Those are great points. Thank you. Absolutely. I remember the Google Glass phenomenon very well. Very well. Well, that's the end of, of my questions for the for the evening. Thank you. Um, Matt, I just want to check and see if we had any questions from the chat that we wanted to be addressed before before we wrap up. I don't know if you're still um, uh, coming up mute. Uh, that is the the last ones we had from the from the Facebook chat. So I think we are we're good for the night. Okay, wonderful. Well, this is just really so enjoyable for me. I, I really love engaging with this topic. And, and thank you so much, Kelsey, for being here. Thank you to the Congresswoman, if you're still watching. Um, thank you for being here. This is great.